his contributions to toxicology last night at the awards ceremony. So I won't repeat all of that because I think many of you know of Kurt and of his many contributions to toxicology. So I'll keep my introduction that brief, and it's my pleasure to introduce the 2012 Mayor Award winner, Dr. Kurt Clausen. Apparatus, 
instead of doing one row at a time, he's doing 12 rows at a time. And if you look here in the background a little bit, at the time I took this picture, they were also putting up windmills. So our farm, our family farm is also a wind farm now. So things change, not only on the farm, but they change in science. So in 1964, when I started graduate school, the animals that we used were rats, mice, and dogs. In fact, probably the most used animal in our department at the time was dogs, uh, which is quite a change from today. And now, uh, in 2012, we have, we have no mice and rats and transgenic mice. That's something that one could have never even dreamt of in, in uh, 1964. Analytical methods, the only method that we had in our lab basically was a colorimeter. We didn't even have a spectrophotometer, so we could tell something if it was light blue or dark blue, or light brown and dark brown. And uh, although I did do a little paper chromatography and thin layer chromatography as a graduate student, uh, radioactivity was just kind of coming on the scene, and that was really magic. I never used it as a graduate student. But then gas chromatography, HPLC, UV came along, HPLC, MS, MS. We did have cell fractionations with the centrifuge. You could make microsomes, but there was no tissue culture. Uh, computers, we were lucky at the University of Iowa. We have one computer on campus. Uh, now, as you know, there's more than one per person. Also, as we've come along, we now have antibodies, so we can do radio amino assays, Western blots, we can measure messenger RNA by various techniques, transcription factors, binding to DNA by various techniques. So, you know, things have just changed in a way, and they will continue to change. So in 1964, basically what we knew was that drugs and xenobiotics cross membranes to their lipid solubility. And we also know, knew, or were learning, that drugs are biotransformed to water-soluble compounds so they do not pass membranes and thus are excreted more rapidly. And it was just being learned that microsomal enzyme inducers increase the cytochrome P450s and enhance the elimination of some drugs. And there might be two cytochrome P450s. <laughs> it was quite debatable at the time. <laughs> well, uh, I today am going to tell you how I have looked at this phenomenon of really being introduced to the concept you could give a chemical to an animal and it would increase the P450s. And to me that concept I think was bigger and different than it maybe was to many people. Because I always thought about drugs. Uh, if you gave drugs or a chemical to an animal, it would either cause injury or if you had a sick animal, you might be able to bring it back to control levels. But what we had here with the P450 inducers is that you were making the liver better, for one function at least. And uh, so today, that's what I'm going to talk about. And in fact, I look at that as what you're really doing is reprogramming the liver. And we'll talk today about some things that we've done with a half a dozen uh, parameters that we've changed to reprogram the liver. So actually, as my master's degree, back in the 60s, you had to get a master's degree before you got a PhD. And so for my master's degree, I really did something more classical as a toxicologist. I looked at the palotoxicity of halogenated hydrocarbons, things like carbon tetrachloride, chloroform, etc. Because the idea was, kind of far out, 
1964 is we might put a dry cleaner in everybody's house. So what do you need if you're going to have a dry cleaner in your house? You're going to need to have these organic solvents. So which would be the best organic solvent to do your dry cleaning? Well, it turns out that while we published that data, it was very good data, none of you have probably dry cleaners in your house. And that's probably a good idea. But when I switched and started working on my PhD dissertation, after I started thinking about this whole ability to reprogram the liver, I said, gee, if the purpose of the P450 inducers was to enhance the elimination of chemicals, might the inducers also increase the elimination of chemicals that are not biotransforming, I've been transformed by enhancing somehow their passage across membranes. And so, back in those days, you didn't need to have uh, animal usage forms, so I just bought some animals and did this experiment without ever telling plot. <laughs> and uh, what I had here was some control rats. And we looked at the plasma disappearance of DBSP. So why are we looking at DBSP? Well, this is just a model chemical. It's a thalene dye. And it's excreted almost entirely in the bile. And you could quantify it because it had a blue color. I mean, you just could quantify anything. You had to have something that had a color to it. Because all we had was a colorimeter. And it turned out that when we gave phenobarbital, one of these P450 inducers, it went away faster. Wow. So that uh, really made me feel good. And I brought the data in the plot. And he said, fine, good, let's publish it. And so we did. And uh, fortunately, uh, this story is still true. In fact, I had a graduate student, Dave Johnson, in 2002, kind of repeat this. And uh, for those of you that know something about the P450s, we now know actually there are a number of P450s. In fact, there are 102 P450s and not two. And, uh, uh, and there are different kinds of inducers. So it turns out that phenobarbital still enhanced it uh, 30, 40 years later. The three methylphalanthrin or the AH agonists do not increase it. If you take a PXR agonist like PCN, it even enhances it better. And how does it enhance it? Where is it? What's going on? Well, it's enhancing its excretion in the bile. Here is a study later on uh, in 74 when we were using radioactivity. <coughs> And you can see with this cardiac glycoside, uh, which is primarily not metabolized, that the plasma disappearance is much more rapid uh, if you're inducing with PCN and enhancing the biliary excretion. So what we've done here is reprogram the liver somehow to make it work better than normal. Well, the problem was, in the 1960s and 70s, about the only thing you could do was measure something going into the liver, which was basically a black box, and something going off. And about all we could say is that we're, we were, quote, kind of reprogramming it. So in essence, what we did is we ran into a brick wall. And it turns out especially in my lifetime, progress depended so much on technology. Well, I then went to a meeting in Europe in the mid-70s, and somebody figured out in Australia, figured out how you could take liver cells and take them out of an animal and culture them. Wow, what an advance. We had tissue culture. So Dave Eaton came to my laboratory, and what we did is we, or what he did, uh, is that he took control rats and made hepatocytes, isolated hepatocytes, and we, he took animals pre-treated with this PCN, 
And then, in essence, what he did at all of these different concentrations was measure the rate of uptake into those cells. So now, at least we could basically do what enzymologists were doing. We could come up with a KM and Vmax for uptake into the liver. And you can see here that these animals, pre-treated with PCM, could take up a cardiac glycoside much better than a control rat. So again, we made this liver better, at least for this function. Well, we ran into a brick wall again, and we couldn't do anything. And this was in uh, the mid to late 70s. And in fact, that brick wall stayed there until the late 90s. I guess I could have stayed home for 20 years, but I didn't. <laughs> and so we switched to a different kind of topic. Uh, and that was, let's look at heavy metals. And again, we came up with a very interesting observation, another one of my graduate students, Peter Gary. It turns out that if you take cadmium, and if you give them four milligrams per kilogram of cadmium IV, and if they're not pre-treated, 100% will die. However, if you pre-treat them with a lower dose of cadmium, let's say eight hours before, only half will die. If, you, if it's 24 hours previously, none would die. So this is a dose that should kill all of them. But even if you just pre-treat them with this kind of medium dose of cadmium here, even two, three weeks later, none of them would die. So in essence, again, you reprogram that liver so it works better, at least in regard to this one little phenomenon. And the reason these animals actually die acutely from cadmium is because of liver injury. And this is one way of measuring liver injury, is this enzyme leaks out into blood, and you can see that an animal that's not pre-treated with cadmium, you get a lot of enzyme released into the plasma. If they've been pre-treated, you actually don't see any liver injury. It's absolutely phenomenal. And in fact, uh, I really wondered at the time if Peter Gehring was cheating a little bit. You know? <laughs> uh, but we repeated this uh, many times, and it still works. So what was going on here? Cadmium is not metabolized, so P450 can't be a part of it. So we looked at the subcellular distribution of cadmium, and what we found is that those animals that have been pre-treated with cadmium, less went to the nuclei, less went to the mitochondria, less went to the microsomes, but more went to the cytosol. So why would you have this subcellular distribution going on? Well, we then took that uh, supernatant of the liver, the liver cytosol, and ran it through a G75 column. And in the no pretreatment, you see here cadmium binding to large molecular weight proteins and very little to the low molecular weight proteins. But if the animals were pretreated with cadmium, you also had all of this bound to some small molecular weight protein. And so what you in essence had here was kind of a, a storage protein that could bind the cadmium in, in a non-toxic form. And what that protein really turned out to be was metallothionine. Here is a, uh, actually when we were doing these studies uh, in actually early 90s, it was neat because uh, knockout animals and transgenic animals became available. And so the real toxicity of cadmium in humans is kidney injury from chronic exposure. And so this is a, a study, a six week study where we administered cadmium to uh, mice and we measure kidney function numerous ways, but for today we'll just talk about this BUM. 
or blood urea nitrogen. So you can see here that in a, 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 a control animal, uh, you start getting a, a nephrotoxicity up at about uh, a dose of one milligram per kilogram. However, in the null animals, it's actually switched over by an order of magnitude. So this is one tenth as toxic, uh, and of course there is no metallophyne. So the reason why these animals are protected is because, again, you've turned on this synthesis, you've reprogrammed it to make metallophyne. It turns out that we make this metallophyne probably the primary purpose is to protect us from, metall from cadmium. It turns out that if you take humans around the world when they die in automobile accidents and see how much cadmium is in their kidney, this is in essence the curve that you will see. If you take people that in, unfortunately die from cadmium toxicity and measure their concentration of kid cadmium in their kidney, you get this kind of a, a curve. And if you already look at this, this is a tenfold difference. So if we didn't make metallophyne, all of us would probably be dead from kidney poisoning by 20 years of age. So we had a reprogram. Well, how about plants? Could plants help you reprogram your liver? Well, it turns out that Jared Liu came to my laboratory from China uh, in the late 80s. And he had basically in a suitcase a whole bunch of herbal plants. <laughs> and I thought, well, let's do one study with these herbal plants. We know, all know, it's folklore, and we can get rid of it. So he, we designed an experiment where we used, uh, these were all pure chemicals that came from herbal medicine, so it wasn't just mixed up. Well, what we did then is that we took uh, mice here, and we pre-treated them for three or four days with these various ingredients of plants. And then we gave them the classic hepatotoxica, uh, which I worked on for my master's <laughs> dissertation, and then measured liver injury. Well, what was kind of surprising to me is that a lot of these chemicals decreased liver injury if we measured ALT or SDH, or even looked at pathology. And uh, it turns out that this OA, or olanolic acid, appeared to be the best. So, well, this is carbon tetrachloride. And, you know, maybe what we were doing is just inhibiting P450. So then what we did is we took about every hepatotoxicant that we could find in the literature, such as bromobenzene, acetaminophen, carbon tetrachloride, thioacetamide, furosemide, phalloidin, colchicine, cadmium, galactosamine, LPS. And as you can see here, again, for every hepatotoxicant that we use, we decrease the toxicity no matter which measure we looked at. Wow, that's pretty amazing. So here is olanolic acid. So we tried to figure out the mechanism of how this might work in the mid-80s. And in the mid-80s, there were things such as gene arrays. And we couldn't figure out how it worked. Well. At the turn of the century, uh, a new pathway was basically learned in science. It's called Keep one nrf 2 Antioxidant Response Element Pathway. Now this pathway is activated, as it turns out, uh, by oxidative stress and electrophiles, etc. And I won't go into a lot of detail other than this KEEP-1 has a lot of sulfide
hydrose in them, in it, and it is in the cytoplasm, and it will release NERF2. The NERF2 goes into the nucleus, binds to the antioxidant response elements. So we question, maybe olanolic acid might be working through this pathway. So we got some knockout animals, uh, and also wild type animals, and we looked to see if there would be an increased amount of this NERF2 going into the nucleus, which you can see here better in this color, and yes, much more goes into the nucleus, and in a knockout animal, of course, that doesn't happen, because there isn't any. We then gave olanolic acid, and you can see these are, quote, not only the amount of NERF2, but its target genes also went up very nicely. So it appears that this plant chemical that we had, again, makes the liver work better by working through this mechanism. Well, what is this mechanism, re what's this really all about, this pathway? So what are the pathways? that it might uh, alter the uh, toxicity of all of those hepatotoxins. So for this experiment, being a pharmacologist and toxicologist, you know, we love dose responses. So here we did a gene dose response. So we took four groups of animals. So we have our wild type animals, our NERF2 animals that don't have any uh, NERF2, and then we have these uh, KEEP1 knockout animals, which really makes them have more KEEP, or more NERF2. So, if you don't believe me, uh, here's what happened. This is the amount of NERF2 that these genetically altered mice have when they're just walking around normal. So now, what does that really, oops, uh, turn out to be. So then we did uh, uh, Gene Array, Connie Wu, who is getting a PhD in my lab, uh, did this quite a nice study, and uh, she determined and compared these four different mice, and for her strict criteria for what it took to be something to be constitutively induced, there had to be an increase between zero and this dose, that dose, and that dose, etc. And it turned out to be 115 induced genes by that criteria, and there were 80 genes that actually were suppressed. So, uh, my lab's interest is largely uh, pharmacokinetic, that is, uptake transporters, phase one, phase two enzymes, and efflux transporters. We don't have time to show you all of that data today, but here is one <coughs> group of enzymes that shows you what happens <coughs> with this different amount of, of NERF2. So this means that there's no NERF2, this means a lot of NERF2. So, in essence, this Glutathione transferase a alpha-2 is basically non-existent in a NERF-2 knockout animal, but look how it increases. Some of these, it's not so dramatic, but glutathione transferase mu-3 is even more dramatic increase. And, but it's not all glutathione transferases, and in fact, you can see here on the bottom, there are some glutathione transferases that aren't increased at all. But, you know, glutathione transferases are definitely very important for decreasing the toxicity of electrophiles, and that's something that toxicologists uh, often are interested in. Another thing that we found out that was quite interesting is that everybody knows about PCDB and AHR receptor, and everybody knows that that the PCDD activates the AHR receptor and turns on all of these genes, these drug metabolism genes. Well, what we really found out, it's not that simple, that for the AHR by itself, 
it will induce these genes. But for to induce these genes, AHR has to go through a second receptor, the NERF2 receptor, to turn on these genes. So there's a lot of things that this uh, a, uh, that the NERF2 receptor does. Now this is my one generalized slide for drug metabolism and drug disposition. That is that on one side of the liver cell, you have uptake by transporters or diffusion. <coughs> Many chemicals are metabolized by cytochrome P450 into nucleophiles. They then go through phase two metabolism like UGTs and sulfotransferase to form conjugates, and they can be transported out of the liver by these MRP transporters. Sometimes it's metabolized to electrophiles that uh, can be quite toxic, but we also have systems such as epoxide hydrolase and ADPH quinone reductase that can force it up here into nucleophiles and we get rid of them. Another way is that these electrophiles, as I just mentioned, can be metabolized by the glutathione transferases to be excreted. Okay, so how does NERF2 enter this picture? Well, what it does, it basically does not increase the cytochrome P450s, but it increases these detoxification systems it increases these phase two drug metabolism systems. It increases the transport out of the cell of these conjugates. It increases the glutathione conjugates. And if that's not enough, it makes more glutathione. I mean, it's kind of like uh, the ideal thing that a toxicologist wants to find. It also not only does that, that is, that increases all of these detoxification processes, but it also increases antioxidant enzymes. For example, as I just mentioned, it increases glutathione synthesis and regeneration. It causes a reduction of hydrogen peroxide enzymes like the glutathione peroxidases. It, uh, it enhances the reduction of oxidized proteins like the glutaridoxins. <laughs> And it also it helps with the reduction of bilirubin and ion sequestering, mainly iron. So it increases the iron binding protein. And as many graduate students today have to learn this process of how hydrogen peroxide in the cell ends up in the water. We have all of these enzymes and processes. Every one is increased by this pathway. So then it came along, actually, probably a good 10 years ago one day, Michael Sporn called me on the telephone, and he is considered the father of chemo prevention. And he asked me, where did we get the old anolic acid? Because what he wanted to do was to make some more potent analogs. And I said, well, Jerry Liu brought this to me from China. And uh, he said, and I said, we have some left and we'll send it to you. And he was very, very happy about that. Shortly thereafter, he ran out of it. So Jerry Liu went back to China, brought back a suitcase full. <laughs> of course, that was before 9-11. <laughs> and so this plant compound that we had worked on in the 80s, uh, olanolic acid, they made a few little changes on this side of the molecule and actually then made what's called now CDDO and a methyl group and an imidazole. And uh, so uh, it turns out that uh, one of those compounds is now called uh, bargoxalone methyl. And there's a small drug company in Texas called Riata that have taken those compounds, which really now is an olanolic acid derivative, 
and they have published a paper for those of you that might be interested. And in essence, so what they've done is given this uh, drug to patients that have very poor kidney and, uh, function. So this is the estimated glomerular filtration rate in these patients when they started out. After they give the drug, there is a, a nice increase in the glomerular filtration rate as estimated uh, in their study. And so the hope is that some of these patients that might have to have dialysis uh, might be able to take this drug and not have dialysis. So uh, it does turn out that Abbott have, has given this company a billion dollars to help uh, develop it, and those of us, Jerry and I, that found it, that get zero. <laughs> <laughs> I don't quite understand this, but that's the way it is. So anyway, presently, you know, we tell our children and grandchildren they should eat fruits and vegetables, and some of us adults use an excuse of having red wine uh, for antioxidants. Uh, I think maybe in the future, we will take pills, and but we'll still break the red wine. <laughs> well, it's now 20 years later uh, or so from when Dave Eaton was in my lab, and we were working on this increase of uptake of compounds into the liver by uh, 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 PX. Uh, a PXR agonist. And one of the major discoveries was really how the cells work as far as making new proteins. So this is supposed to be DNA, and it turns out that the transcription factor will come in here, bind to the DNA, and then we make this RNA. And then from this RNA, we make proteins. So that was a huge advance in, in science that we've all seen. And here is an uh, animation kind of picture of how this works with some uh, nuclear receptors. So here is the cell, here is the DNA, here is the transcription factor that sits on the DNA. And uh, so what happens? Uh, Anyhow, it activates it. <laughs> Let's see if we can go back. Anyhow, yeah, there it is. So in essence, what you see here is the, this here now is the a transcription factor that sits down on the uh, DNA. The ligand, or the chemical that we give, comes on here and binds. It has a release of this co-repressor and a co-activator comes and binds this all together, and then you get transcription uh, initiated. So we now can kind of come back to this whole business of P450 inducers 20 years later. And in fact, the other thing that really had been learned in that 30 years, that those uh, transcription factors as far as most of us in pharmacology or toxicology, I should say, are interested in, are given here. The AHR receptor turns on a certain SIP, CAR, PXR, PPR, alpha, and then we have this NERF2 that I was talking about. But what we're going to talk about the rest of, or the next few minutes, is this PXR. So this is called the pregnant X receptor. The other thing that had been learned during this 20 years that the liver was no more a black box, but actually we have these transporters that take chemicals from the liver or from the blood into the liver cell, and then there are other transporters that take these chemicals and put them either into the bile or back into the blood. So all of that had to be learned before we could move on. 
And in some of that studies, it really appeared that maybe one of these transporters shown on the previous slide, namely OATP1A4, might have been the transporter that we were looking at 20 years ago that was transporting cardiac glycosides. So we made an antibody uh, to uh, uh, the OATP1A4, and we note that in normal mice now, this is the amount of OATP1A4 protein. But if you give PCN or one of these other PXR agonists, it increases it dramatically. So we think that this is the uh, transporter that really transported SIP, and it's really being turned on, it's being reprogrammed by having this uh, uh, PCN that we gave to the animals. Uh, another one of my students, Jeff Stodinger, made a a PCN knock, I mean a PXR knockout mouse. And so here you can see the amount of OATP1A4 messenger RNA when we give PCN in a wild type mouse really goes up. But in a knockout mouse that doesn't have the PXR, of course it can't go up. So uh, it turns out we now know that all of these a transcription factor can increase not only cytochrome P450s, but some of them do phase two, as well as some transporters. Okay, so now I told you that uh, this transcription factor uh, that PCN binds to, which is called the PXR transcription factor, uh, goes into the nucleus and sits down on the DNA. Well, there have been other people that have worked on this in regard to inducing the cytochrome P453A4, which is the cytochrome P450 that metabolizes most number of drugs. But in regard to these places where it sits down on the DNA, there's what are called direct repeats, and you can see here like AGGTCA, and then AGGTCA, and then there's a spacer in between. There can also be inverted repeats, there can be inverted repeats, but today we're talking about uh, uh, direct uh, repeat three. So, in regard to cytochrome P453As, people think it's a direct repeat 3 that's most important. That is an AGTTCA, and that's this uh, 3, and then AGTTCA. So that's why it's called a direct repeat 3. So therefore, we look to see if the same thing might be happening with the, our, our PXR. That is, what is it really binding to here, the PXR, to open this up and turn it off? <coughs> well, one of the ways that you can do this now with the newest technology is by uh, doing what's called uh, uh, global PXR DNA binding sites. So you, in essence, uh, bind the transcription factor to the DNA. So how would you bind the transcription factor to DNA? Well, you have to be a toxicologist, and you say, use formaldehyde. <laughs> and so you mix a little formaldehyde in there, it sticks them together, and now you can see, uh, in essence, the various DNAs, of pieces of DNA, that uh, is, is bound, uh, that your PXR binds to. Okay, now you got these little pieces of, uh, of, of uh, nucleotides, and you have to kind of figure out where these uh, string of nucleotides that are only a couple hundred in a row fit in your 
your whole genome. And if you type this genome, we figured out on Saturday, with your normal typewriter, it would take 1,000, no, 1 million, 500,000 pages. So it takes a lot of graduate students to go up and down all of those pages <laughs> to find them. But fortunately, we have powerful computers today, and they do it overnight. So if you do that, <clears throat> what you find out for one of the many, many genes that we have, that, and this gene now is CYP3A11, which is a cytochrome P450 that metabolizes many drugs. In the control animal, those things are binding here and here. And this is where you're transcribing the gene. After you give PCN, you get more binding, more binding, and a lot of additional bindings along here. It does turn out that many of these are dr 3 some are dr 4 So now we go to our transporter. Well, this looked quite different in that there's really only one, there's only one site at which there is binding. Uh, and after you give PCN, there's much more binding. The other thing that was kind of, well, extremely interesting is that there's no DR3 or DR4 that we were looking for. The only thing we could find was a DR9. And the other thing is that this was 10 kilobases upstream from where the gene starts, way upstream. So. Uh, we did some more work to exactly see how it was sitting down on the DNA. And yes, it is that same direct repeat. A, G, T, T, C, A. A, G, T, T, C, A. But if we looked where it was binding, yes, there are some DR4s, uh, DR9s, DR14, DR19, etc. And you know, what's going on here? Fortunately, again, I have much brighter graduate students than I am, and uh, they looked at this and said, gee, if you'd have read the literature when you were in high school, you would have found out that Watson and Crick said that DNA does this. And in essence, if you look here, you have uh, four missing, nine missing, 14 missing. So in essence, what we think is going on, we have an accordion model. So our PXR, RXR binds like this, like this, like this, and that's the way we think it works. So the binding of transcription factors did not, does not explain everything, and I will uh, start going a little bit more rapidly because uh, Lois is getting nervous. And <laughs> just want to say that uh, in, in addition to uh, uh, these genetic factors, we're also now looking at epigenetic factors, namely DNA methylation, histone modulation, you really methylate the DNA. And normally, you can transcribe a gene very nicely, and we put a go sign on there. Whereas, if you have these methyl groups, it can stop the expression. It also turns out that our chromosomes aren't a nice straight line, but our uh, DNA is wrapped around these histones. And it turns out that if you make this looser, as you can see, then a gene can be transcribed. Although if you methylate here, as an example, in different places, it'll stop the gene transcription. So that's kind of what we're working on now, as well as microRNAs that can take the messenger RNA and basically cut it apart. 
So the two very last things I'll talk about is uh, our additional ways in which the liver reprograms itself. So back in 72, uh, when I was an assistant professor, I looked at uh, I looked at the LD50 of Wabe in rats of various ages. No graduate student today could believe that anybody did all of these LD50s. These are each uh, an LD50. Uh, but that's the way it was in the early 70s. But as you can see here, the toxicity of Wabe of uh, the LD50 in a newborn uh, rat is about four milligrams per kilogram. But as the rat gets older, it becomes more tolerant. So again, there has to be some reprogramming going on. And in fact, we know it's the liver because we also gave radioactive wabe to these animals, and the young animals, and 40-day-old animals, and looked at the concentration of wabing in these various tissues. But the important one is, is it doesn't concentrate in the liver of the newborn, but it concentrates in the liver of an adult animal. So something happened there, and of course it is that transport. Well now, we are not just looking at one gene at a time, but we are looking at the reprogramming of the liver naturally after birth. And so it turns out that we have found out that there are 7,825 differentially expressed genes out of the total of 20,000 genes in mice that occur between minus two days of age to 60 days of age. And if I just show you on the next slide, this is the liver transporters and if we look at those liver transporters uh, with age, again, from minus two days of age to 60 days of age, red means high or hot. This is a heat map. So the hotter the temperature, the higher, or the blue is the colder. And so you can see in these adult animal, or in these, these genes, these transporters aren't fully expressed until the animal is about 30 days age, of age or so. We have some other transporters, for example, that mature during the adolescent age. Other genes are actually higher before birth, and these are transporters, and decrease with age. So why is that? What's going on? And the last one is, that I'm going to show you is diet. So here is just taking <coughs> livers from mice from various diets. Here is a purified diet that we probably all should be using. This is a regular lab chow, so you can see how many differences there are, how many genes are regulated different in lab chow compared to a purified diet. We have high fat, high cholesterol, etc. And look at diet restriction how that changes things. So again, the liver is being reprogrammed with chemicals, it's being reprogrammed with age, it's being reprogrammed with diets. So what is the significance and conclusion from this whole thing? And that is that liver can be programmed and reprogrammed. It is being programmed and reprogrammed. This is the way that the liver adapts to its environment. We have over a billion liver cells, and every one of those liver cells has the hardware and the software to be reprogrammed. And what reprograms it? Chemicals. It's chemicals that alter the program. Who knows about chemicals? Pharmacologists and toxicologists. It turns out that there are no drugs for liver failure in the world. But if we can learn which chemicals will turn on and turn off the various programs, we will have drugs for liver diseases. For example, for cirrhosis and fatty liver, we can drink uh, 
without feeling guilty about hurting our liver maybe someday. Uh, in regard to excretory function, functions such as jaundice and hyperbilirubinemia. Nutritional functions. I mean, we can treat obesity and diabetes by working on the liver. Clotting factors. How many people don't die from heart attacks and strokes? Where do the clotting factors come from? The liver. How about atherosclerosis? Where does cholesterol come from? The liver. How about injury repair? So if you have a chemical that injures your liver, how can you repair it? Well, if you give the right chemical, once we learn this, a little better. And lastly, we might be able to stimulate the growth of stem cells. So overall, I'd just like to say that uh, my career has been a tremendous amount of fun. I had a lot of fun working with my students. And I really don't plan to quit. People don't make me quit. Uh, and uh, it's really uh, uh, been a, a fun occupation. And for those graduate students that might be here, I hope that you continue working and have as much fun in your career as I've been having in my career. And uh, the advances that will probably be made in the next 43 and a half years will be much more than in the last 43 and a half years. So uh, with that, I would just like to uh, push the last button. And to all of you, uh, I'd like to say thank you.